Hello, and welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a podcast about statistics with visual aids. Crawling out of my stats teacher nest and blinking in the light, my name is Tess, and my pronouns are she and they. With me, who had already been well out of the ground for a while, it's Bart. Hi, Bart. Hey, how's it going? Um, I go by he and him, and since the last episode, uh, go on home, British soldiers, go on home. Have you got no fucking homes of your own? Uh, well <laughs> done to Sinn Féin. United Socialist Ireland soon. We can but hope. Maybe Star Trek got it right. <laughs> <laughs> we also have a guest who is emerging from the nearest body of water with a shit-eating grin and some sort of horrible ocean creature. It's Sarah. They're not horrible. They're <laughs> gentle and they're kind. You just need to not touch the bottom bits. The bottom <laughs> bits will hurt you. The top <laughs> bits are fine, though. Um, hello, my name is Sarah. I have also she, they pronouns. I'm delighted to be here. So Sarah is an aspiring environmental science educator, their own description, and produce and feature in It Came From The Sea pod. So right. this week, we dragged Sarah around to talk about microplastic pollution. <laughs> this is going to be a potentially somewhat depressing episode. So first off, I want to talk about what are microplastics? So as the name might suggest, and as our beloved audience might already know, they are a form of plastic pollution. Specifically, these are small p pieces of plastic. The uh, typical definition for micro plastics is like uh, less than five millimeters. This is our typical. But a particular paper that we're going to be focusing on today defines macroplastics specifically as 0 0.33 to 4.75 millimeters. Oh, and that's um, a lot of these definitions, when they get that specific, it's based on the type of filters that are available. Yeah. Um, so so it's this... not saying that microplastics can't be out of different sizes. It is just like, well, these are the ones that we can actually like strain yeah, out yeah. of. Yeah. So they also defined meso plastics as 4.76 to 200 millimeters and macro plastics as greater than 200 millimeters in size. Now, the Americans listening to this are probably wondering mm -hmm. what the fuck a millimeter is. Um, an inch is about 25 millimeters. So that gives you an idea of the sort of scale we're dealing with here. And these are based on Eric et al. 2014. Now, Sarah, this mm. is based on the filters that they used, but in general, what happens below this 0 0.33 millimeter mark? So below that, what you're getting at is uh, as plastic gets into the ocean, it, it doesn't stay in its original form. And this is true for any, any material in a natural environment. It will change form over time. Um, with plastics in particular, while they are very durable, they will degrade. They will break down. And so below 0 0.33 millimeters, a lot of what you're getting at that point is just plastic that has broken down so thoroughly that you just can't pick it up through a filter. And I think we're going to talk about kind of the ways that we collect microplastics and, yep. and mesoplastics and macroplastics. And a lot of it just sort of feeds into that where in order to like identify a plastic that was smaller than 0 0.33 millimeters you would essentially have to do it chemically you would have to do like a chemical analysis of like what is the composition of this sample and even that wouldn't tell you how many bits are below that size it would just yeah. tell you kind of the mass that is in that sample that is that plastic so this is really saying that like below 0 0.33 millimeters we cannot identify it because mm. we're using our, our bare eyes uh, well, not our bear eyes. We're using a microscope, but still at some point, like you just, you can't tell the difference on your own. Yeah. So one of the terms I saw was nanoplastics, which yep. I went, oh no, but I imagine that's usually referred <laughs> to the stuff that's even much smaller than this. That, um, some people will use it to discuss a lot of different, just small plastic fibers, which is one of the most, well, most common is, is a loaded term. Mm -hmm. Um, but microplastic fibers are very very common in the ocean yeah um and so when you're talking about nanoplastics it's usually talking about fibers not so much particles um and it is usually so small that you couldn't detect them at all with with the naked eye yeah. much less like being able to find them in a microscope then becomes very very difficult so Mm. If you find nanoplastics, the papers that I have read that identified them, it was usually like we cut open a fish 
we were looking at the flesh of a fish. And so you have a much smaller kind of, you're not looking at a whole sample from the open ocean. You're looking at the flesh of one potentially very small um, piece of marine life. Yeah, right. And then you can kind of go through and it's a lot less surface area for you to look at under a microscope. And then you might be able to see nanoplastics. Yeah, right. Or, right, or you can run that through um, different, like, very expensive machines to do a breakdown, like a chemical breakdown of all of the different molecules that are present in a sample. And then that chemical breakdown might give you some sort of result that suggests that there's plastic there that you didn't see. Mm. And then because you didn't see it, but the signature is there, like the chemical signature is there, then you can say, okay, well, it was probably nanoplastics because we couldn't see it, Yeah, but it was picked up. Uh, microplastics likely to come from bigger plastic sources or do we put uh do we have products and stuff that put microplastics into the ocean at the size that they are yeah that's a really good question it's it is both um and we will talk i think a little bit about that further that is in fact my next point so let's go oh perfect (laughs) so it is both um there are when we when you have um plastic that you're using in your daily life and that can be anything from a molded toy a plastic toy or single-use plastic packaging or something. The way that plastic starts its life is as a small plastic pellet, a bead called a nurdle, just like industrial plastic. Um, this is not, in nurdles, fact, the uh, larval stage of the titular nerd, by the way. I think it might be both. <laughs> I assume that it's both, just with a different, ste- different spelling. Mm. Um, and those industrial beads are usually about five millimeters in diameter, so... They are microplastic in the way they're formed. And so you have these massive quantities, these shipping containers usually, that are full of these plastic nurdles, these industrial pellets that are then shipped from, a lot of them are manufactured in China, shipped across the Pacific Ocean, um, sometimes shipped you know, across the Pacific Ocean, and then also across the Atlantic Ocean, where they're used for inject- injection molding. They're melted down at, um, in, in like industrial uh, spaces, across the world um but a lot of those shipping containers get lost at sea and the estimates are vast a lot of these shipping companies don't report it it could be anywhere from hundreds to thousands per year i'm shocked um and so in that in that case you are getting microplastics directly dumped into the open ocean Um, that feels like shipping hasn't changed in like 300 years or something. <laughs> We're still losing them. Yeah, the essentially. Ocean. Oh, no, no. It's gotten more destructive <laughs> because instead of yeah. wind power, it's now diesel. Yeah, that's part of it. Um, they can also stack. Like, they are they can stack these containers a lot higher. They're not always accounting for the increased storms that are occurring because of climate change. So, right, uh, so the, the stack. The expectation mm-hmm. of shipping losses is inaccurate in that respect. Right, and I'm sure they're adjusting for it just because capitalism, right? So they're going to want to understand that. But they aren't necessarily changing their methods to match that. Those those shipping containers, when you see them and they're bogged down with just, you know, stacks on stacks of shipping containers on these ships, Mm. they're not secured in any way. Right, so they're just stacked. They're not actually held down. Yes, they are (laughs) relying on the weight and the shape to just sort of hold them in place. Oh dear! I, yes. I I thought they were secured on those far out. I That's... did too for a very long time. I, I well, I guess it would take time, and time is money, and it's acceptable. Oh, well, how losses. do you do it? Yeah. If you have you know, if you have them six, seven, eight containers high, what do you have that's long enough or sturdy enough to actually yeah. secure those in place? Mm. Um. And so that's that's one way we get direct like microplastics directly dumped into the ocean. Um. They're used to, it used to be very common in like face washes to have microplastic beads. And that's actually illegal in a lot of countries now. It's illegal in the US um, mm. to have like those abrasive beads to try to like scrub your face. Now, if you have like scrubby face stuff, it's usually uh, almond shells or walnut shells. It's like something else. It's something more organic. Like, natural. Yeah. So organic right. as in comes from a plant as opposed to organic as in organic chemistry, because those are different things. <laughs> right. Um, and then the other place, so that is that is an input of microplastics. It's probably not, if you're going by weight, that might be one of the, like one of the most by mass. Mm. But if you're going by amount, 
just like how many of these plastic microplastic pieces it's probably nowhere near as much as um, plastic that has been dumped into the ocean as macroplastic as something big enough you could see it and then broken down and so fishing nets are actually considered the primary source of microplastics in the open ocean because they're made of plastic fibers and those you know they just wear down they wear down mm. from normal wear and tear they get lost at sea or left at sea um and then they break down because of uv light and the physical force of the waves battering against them and then those fibers because there's so much surface area to a fiber they just break down pretty quickly and then you do end up with a lot of microplastic fibers that are much more common in a sample than a plastic bead or pellet right so i was going to ask about that so your plastic materials the you said so physical processes like abrasion and uv mm -hmm. degradation are these right so UV degradation, I guess, would be considered a chemical change and that it would break up the bonds of the material itself. Is there right. any, it, like, other things, like, as oceans heat up, is this increasing the process? As oceans become more acidic, does that influence that process as well? As far as I have read, that those changes that are occurring that are incredibly uh, damaging to ocean life with the pH and with the uh, the temperature, which are are related um they're actually not very they don't impact plastic degradation that much yet i mm. guess would be a way to put it that's not to say climate change isn't making it worse as i mentioned the you know increase in storms is making it much worse um the uv factor is increasing in some areas and so if you have stronger uv light it or goes just faster. heat is held on more it will happen a lot faster um you're right in that it's a chemical change, but the chemical change is sort of what happens is less that the sun just breaks everything apart and more that the sun makes the plastic very brittle. Right, and, and then so it's the, more prone to the abrasive. Exactly. Okay. Um, the other way that plastic breaks down in the ocean is through marine life just biting it. <laughs> yes. Just taking, taking chunks out of it. Right, so this leads me into my next question, which is why do we care about microplastics? Um, and I, I think that is such a good question to ask for most people. It would seem like, right, like, well, obviously we care because it's it's not a natural thing and we're putting it in the natural environment. Um, but it's just not quite that simple. Um, there are really clear reasons to care about it because of how it is affecting marine life. Um, you know, you have direct physical harm, which is kind of the classic, like, a whale stomach full of plastic that it thought was, you know, quote unquote thought was jellyfish um sea turtle with a straw stuck up its nose mm. um a six pack of beer or like soda with the rings around it that you need to cut up because otherwise a turtle might get stuck in it like that does happen but it's incredibly rare that that happens yeah kind of the the more the more scary thing to me is actually like the indirect physical harm through through things like um like if you know, if a creature di like eats a bunch of plastic, that plastic might not actually directly harm them. They might be able to just poop it out and it's totally fine, but it will make them feel like they're full. Mm. And then they might not eat when they need to eat. So they're kind of dying of malnutrition rather yeah. than choking on plastic. And that's, that's an issue. Um, another one is that most of the plastics that we use are treated with chemicals called persistent organic pollutants. Um, and then the organic in that is, as, as you mentioned, Tess, like that's for organic chemi organic chemicals. So it's not saying that it's like a, a chemical that was made in nature. It is saying that it is a chemical that is based on carbon. And because it is a carbon-based chemical, it can act inside the body of an organism as if it were like a chemical that organism just, just mm. uses. So a lot of these POPs actually act in bodies in place of hormones. Right. Um, and so that causes these really serious issues where, where you get persistent organic pollutants messing with uh, a population's ability to reproduce. Mm. So it will either, there are some POPs that will cause entire generations to be born without, um, without sperm producers. Mm. And so you... You have a lot of a lot of marine life is able to kind of switch between it's kind of hermaphroditic where it can either produce ova or it can produce sperm and these POPs are making it so it, they can't produce sperm right and that means 
right? Like, then you have a whole population that can't reproduce. Yeah, it's a bit fucked up. Yeah, it's really bad. And then you do have, like, the more the more obvious ones where POPs can cause very clear, distinct physical deformities in, like, in generations. So you might not see it in the, in the fish, for example, that ate a piece of plastic that was treated with POPs. But in their offspring, you might see that a lot of their offspring don't, like, aren't formed correctly, are missing a fin, are missing mm. gills, or are missing internal organs because these POPs are leaching into the eggs. They're, they're just messing with the biochemistry. Um, another really, like, I think one that is kind of easier for people to wrap their heads around is a really common persistent organic pollutant to treat plastic with is a UV blocker. You know, if you go out and buy a beach ball, that beach ball is treated with chemicals that make it less likely to get brittle and to break down in the sun. Mm. But if those chemicals then leach into phytoplankton, plankton that use photosynthesis to grow, such as algae or corals that need photosynthesis to grow, well, now they can't. Now they've just ingested a chemical that specifically is designed to prevent them from using UV light and UV radiation to photosynthesize. So there's a lot of a lot of different ways that we know that these organic pollutants are interrupting things, and there's a lot of uh, risks that we we don't know yet. Yeah, that we haven't been able to study because the oceans are vast and the the connections between communities are very very complicated. And so you, you just don't know what you don't know. Um, and so that's kind of, that's kind of where I land with it is like, well, we do have all these, you know, why should you care? It's because we don't know what, what we're missing yet. Um, so with respect to that, one of the things I have seen some writing on, not so much now, but uh, a couple, like 10, 15 years ago, sort of thing was talking about heavy metal accumulation in the food chain in the ocean. So... Yes. Uh, if people have not heard of this, this is stuff like arsenic, mercury, not good things to be in your body, or oh, lead as well. So yet another thing that's not as cool as it sounds. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just coagulation of heavy metal, unfortunately. But what it's happens... Just a bunch of fish listening to like really good tunes from the 80s. I know. Ugh. So what happens is your filter feeders, like your, your mussels and shellfish and some crustaceans yes. and things like that, eat a whole bunch of this stuff but they don't excrete it. So it builds up in their bodies in potentially quite small amounts. But when they get predated by something larger, then the amount that is in each of these individual organisms that gets eaten by something bigger accumulates in the bigger thing. Mm. And that kind of feeds its way up the food chain until you get some potentially quite dangerous levels of this sort of thing in like large predatory fish. Uh, I think tuna is one of the most notorious for this. Tuna is really bad with mercury, yeah. Yeah, so does the same thing happen with microplastics? Yes, um, it absolutely does. So both both literally and that microplastics will also absorb <laughs> heavy metals. Yeah. And so that will like that will happen. Um, a lot of heavy metals will cause uh, neurological issues with with creatures. And so something that they're finding with um, actually with salmon in the Puget Sound. Uh, and if you, you know, if you know anything about the Pacific Northwest of the United States is that uh, the salmon there is like a huge thing, both mm. culturally for the native populations and just, you know, for everybody around there. It's what you what the area is really known for. And there is a chemical that is in tires on cars that is leaching into the waterways and it's causing salmon to have sudden die offs after rains. Mm. And it's that it's that these plastics are either made with these pollutants already or they're absorbing them and then they're getting into the food chains and they're right these these fish just can't they can't digest them yeah um and then with plastics in particular like that we we're seeing that as well um we're seeing that mussels and other filter feeders other bivalves are absorbing a lot of these these fibers and these pellets that would you know in a traditional fish they have fish have a very simple digestive tract mm. compared to you know compared to mammals especially where a lot of bigger chunks of plastic will just pass right through them mm. but a bivalve doesn't uh, filter feeders generally just don't um and so what they're having what they're finding is that even if a filter feeder 
you know, gets a plastic fiber in it and tries to pass it. Instead, it just gets lodged into its flesh. Well, and then right. it gets eaten. As you, as you pointed out, it just moves up the trophic levels. And so mm. when you find uh, gulls and other coastal birds that are, you know, that have a lot of plastic in their gut, a lot of that is from that. It's from smaller fish or being eaten by bigger fish, being eaten by bigger fish, being eaten by these birds, where the fish are kind of able to just tank a lot of this physical plastic debris. Yeah. And the birds aren't. The birds mm. do just have a much more either complex or just slow moving digestive tract where this plastic is getting stuck. And that's where we're seeing a lot of these die offs where the fish populations maybe aren't obviously suffering. But we're losing a lot of our coastal birds. Is this um? Mm. Do microplastics have an effect on human populations who uh, rely on seafood as a uh, as a big food source? That's one that we're not. Uh, we're s- jury's still out. Essentially, where plastic has been found inside human bodies, but what the impact of that plastic is is still kind of unknown. Um, you can you definitely do see in areas where populations are reliant on on fish on seafood when these plastic when these plastics are really bad and they are choking off fish they are like you know decreasing the fish populations those coastal communities are experiencing food shortages mm. um and that can you know, that can lead to really harmful outcomes. It's not microplastics actually overfishing, but the Ebola outbreak that we had a few years ago right. is directly related to coastal communities not having avail- not having the availability of fish, and then seeking other unusual forms of protein for their diets. So, yeah, yeah they are the the impacts are wide ranging when we're talking about these, you know, it's hard because the plastic doesn't always impact the populations negatively but then when it does it can be extremely harmful so there's just a lot of gray area for science to still kind of pick through and figure out so with that respect is there well this is kind of a big question but are there situations where there's been kind of a threshold effect so below a certain level the plastic pollution is not so bad that it causes these fish die-offs or whatever else but then it hits something and everything goes wrong all of a sudden I the only place I've read about something like that happening has been with the coho salmon in the Pacific Northwest, um, mm. and that one is is a little bit different just because it is kind of a more direct impact when when we have uh, kind of a dry period in that area and you have a lot of cars driving over roads that aren't being washed off regularly with rain. Yeah, right. The chemicals from the tires build up, the rubber from the tires build up. And then when you have kind of your first rain after a period that's been pretty dry, that's when mm. we see these like sudden massive die-offs of um, coho salmon. Um, I think, and that, that is it's related to just you know they reach a certain threshold where like now they can't escape that yeah. level of pollution. But I haven't seen, so far at least, I haven't seen similar things for physical plastic pollution. Mm. All right, so now we've got a bit of an idea of what they are, why we care about them. Let's talk about how they are actually measured and estimated. So this is the kind of statistical nitty gritty stuff. So the first first thing I want to talk about is actually units of measurement. Because within plastics, we're looking at objects of many, many different sizes, as we saw. And also plastics come in different densities. So the denser plastic will have more mass per like unit size right than the less dense plastics so if you want an overall unit of measurement what i have seen used uh this is again old mate ericsson at al 2014 what they had were pieces per kilometer squared so in this case the km squared is actually distance covered when tow uh when towing yeah. a filter so could we talk about this a little bit how did this sort of measurement come about and how does it relate to the actual samples that you take this is kind of like the quintessential this the ericsson et al is like the quintessential microplastics and the ocean paper it is it is the one that we all reference um and not to say it's the first it was the first that kind of looked at 
all of the other papers and brought them together and kind of worked to create a more unified version of microplastic sampling. Mm. Um, and it's pretty eye-opening to read it. I think if you're kind of on the outside looking in, you assume there's more sophisticated methods, but there aren't. Um, the way the way we sample microplastics in particular, because you can't see them with the open eye, with the naked eye, um, is that you take what is called a manta net. It's called a manta net because it kind of looks like a manta ray. It's a box that is varying lengths. The ones that I have used were, I think, oh gosh, maybe a meter wide, mm. so relatively wide for the opening. And then I think it was 20 centimeters tall. So like one meter, like a hundred centimeters by 20 mm. centimeters. And that was kind of our shape. And then I had it on a, a line uh, it's a tat oh, behind it is a big net. Uh, there's a net that like drags behind it, and at the end of the net is like a little collection bucket. Right. Um, so the manta it, uh, net specifically controls how much water goes in. Correct. That's right. how you know the approximate amount of water that is going through. Yep. So it's, it's no greater than yeah. Yeah. But it's on the surface, so it's bouncing yep. around depending on how fast the ship is towing it, depending on how choppy the water is. If it's in the water properly, it's got these wings on the side that act as floats, it will mm. be submerged about 10 centimeters is what you want. You want okay. it about half submerged. Um, and then you just chuck it off the back of a ship. Mm. It's towed on a rope. You start a timer as soon as it hits the water, and then you time it for, you know, it can be any length of time. Um, when I did it, we were only doing 20 minutes at a time. Right. And then you haul it back in. And so okay. you can already see there's a lot of room for Yeah, so my first question inaccuracy. is, do you associate the time that it's in the water with the speed that the boat is going to give you a distance? Yes. That's, okay. The ship has kind of a black box the way a plane does that's always recording how fast it's going, where it's at. Um, it's all synced like through GPS. And so I make a note of, I dropped it in the water at this specific time, and I... Yep always checking back with the clock usually what we would do is i had a walkie talkie i would be on the weather deck i would somebody i would have somebody back in the dry lab that was looking at the the ship time mm -hmm. and we would coordinate so i would let them know like the mantinet is in the water they would tell me the exact time that the ship is recording i would write that down same thing when i towed it back out and so you do know not only how fast the ship is going the whole time which hopefully is fairly steady yeah. um you could also relate that back to GPS coordinates. Yeah, right. So I wasn't uh, doing that. I was an undergrad, but if you're doing it, you know, if you're probably, doing that yeah. for right for a professional paper, that's what you would do. You would make sure that you're keeping track of the exact GPS coordinates, the distance that you traveled. Yeah, and while so, you were towing it. Okay, so I have a question about that because this kilometer squared is given as an area, not a distance. Yes. Yes. So. Um, how do you kind of get from the, the one-dimensional distance to the two-dimensional pieces per area? You just multiply it by the width of whatever mantinet you are towing. Oh, right. That's, that's clever. So um, mm -hmm. this is distance times net size. Right. So if you picture it like when you vacuum a carpet and you can yep. see the lines that you vacuumed, that's, that's what we're doing with it. That's really neat. That's the most common way to do it. Um, there are other methods that you can use, especially if you want to look at plastic that's a little bit deeper in the water column. Mm. Um, but anytime you see it in, in that, you know, pieces per kilometer squared, or some people will do it in mass per kilometer squared, um, there's a lot of different ways you can count the plastic after you have it. Um, yes. That's, that's probably what's going on. They're probably using a manta net and then towing it behind a vessel. That raises uh, two questions, the first of which is to talk about locations. So these are the locations from that Ericsson um, paper. The little dot, each little dot is where they did a tow, and right. um, the color of the dot indicates the uh, plastic pollution presence. So these numbers are in that pieces. Yep, per kilometer squared. Yeah, km squared sort of numbers. So. I don't know a hell of a lot about oceanography, as you might imagine. What leads them to choose where these locations will be? That, the, when, uh, when you, this, this is one of the biggest kind of struggles with directly studying the ocean is mm. 
when you are planning a research cruise, there is not one question being answered. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, and this is pretty similar if you have like any kind of science that you want that you need to collect field samples for. You try to maximize the maximize the amount of research you can do. Yeah, because it's so, bloody expensive every time. Oh, it's so expensive, especially you know you take the amount that it would take to send somebody on kind of a field camp experience to go and collect stuff, and then you put them on a boat. Yeah, it's it's a lot of money. It's a lot of time. Um, so very often you're kind of if you are looking to study microplastics specifically, you are looking at either your your institution if that's what you're limited to, like I was. Either looking at your institution schedules for when their research vessel is going out, or you're looking at um, kind of other institutions that you might be able to, to kind of, you know, get yourself onto one of their cruises. And mm -hmm. you're looking at all these schedules and you're saying like, okay, if I want to study, you know, if I wanted to study surface plastic pollution in the North Pacific, I'm going to look at everybody who is going on those cruises and I'm going to kind of pitch myself to them like, hey, yeah. while you're doing that would you be willing to do these toes with me? Uh, plastic pollution is kind of a hot topic. So you yeah, know, you can might usually get some traction get, there. You can get some traction, but at the same time, in order to do these net toes, you have to slow way down. Ah, um, okay. Which is not unique in oceanography. There are other types of samples where people would need to slow down, but for the most part, the way oceanography happens is you kind of steam as fast as possible to a fixed GPS location, and then you spend a day there dropping uh, what we mm. call a rosette, dropping a piece of equipment down through the water column to collect samples, and then back up. Right, whereas so, you have to kind of interrupt that system in order to do this sort of sampling. Fully. So you're wasting, you know, not wasting, <laughs> but you are... Let's say diverting resources. How about that? You're slowing everything down a lot to do these toes. Mm. Um, I'm pretty sure specifically in this one, they actually used sample data from a number of other cruises as well, mm. uh, which is becoming a little bit more common and people are getting a little bit better at standardizing how they record and report the amounts of plastic. Yeah. So um, one of the things I was going to ask about that is, um, are these... Is the kind of mouth size for the, for the net, the manta, is that standard? No, it's not. So right, okay. There are different sizes of manta net you can get. Um, there are different. They're all going to be basically the same shape, luckily. Mm. So that's not too bad. And as long as you are recording, it's still science. So it still is like people are still going to be recording the amount of water that went through a manta net. Pretty yeah. That's similarly. that's that's what I was worried about because if you've got like something with the mouth this size. And a mouth this size, right? This is going to collect more stuff through it, and so you would expect a greater number of pieces in the net. And people are recording exactly the size of a manta net that they are. Oh, towing. that's good. So, so you, that's, you can, you can yeah. standardize for that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, the other thing is similarly with the net size, with the mesh that is behind a manta net opening. Um, that's not always the same. Yeah. Um, so that is that is again part of why you have that wiggle room of like sizes between you know x millimeters and x millimeters is like you know we might have had you know there's some wiggle room there most of the nets are about the same but they might be a little bit different depending on what country manufactured your nets so with my to my eye that mostly affects the minimum size yes more than the kind of the maximum, I guess. The maximum would be dictated by this. The minimum is di dictated by the net material. Right. Well, the maximum would also be like, I had samples, I had um, plastics in my samples that were so big that they were not um, microplastics. Yeah. And so then you do just physically, well, you have multiple sieves. There's a process where you, you collect everything in the little like kind of bucket net at the bottom of your manta. Mm. You wash everything down into it, and then you take that and you run it through several sieves. Yeah, so that's an, another thing that I wanted to uh, talk about is the actual like physical process by which this counting is done. So mm -hmm. the description in Ericsson was that it was manually uh, sorted, yep. which sounds <laughs> like an absolute nightmare for me. So yeah. what does that actually involve? 
so on the ship, as soon as you collect them, you do have to run it through. First off, you get the manta. The net behind it is probably three meters long, roundabouts. So it's long. You have to haul it up on a crane. Um, or you have to have multiple people kind of holding it up around you. And then you take a hose that um, is fresh water usually. You don't really need it to be seawater. So it kind of like kills and, and cleans off a lot of the, the surface life. Mm. It's unfortunate casualties of war here. Um, you hose everything down into the bucket. You detach the bucket. And then you take what is about a liter of, of room, which might be full of... Mine was always full of little, like, jellies. So you uh, wash everything down, and um, mine was always full of little salps, little, like, tiny jelly boys. Um, and then you take that into kind of a lab space inside so you don't accidentally wash everything off, you know, off the side of the ship. Mm. And then you run it through several sieves. And the sieves look like, like the kind of, like... It's a metal version of, like, the plastic pan you would take to the beach as a kid. Right. Kind of like sift through all the sand. And so you run it through first a fairly large one and then a little bit of a smaller one. And then for me, that was where I stopped on the ship because we just didn't have the resources to go any further. And then I collected what was left in a sample bottle. So it was still pretty wet. I still had some some life in there. So what Um, sort of volume would you have from a single net after that? It really depends. Um, Like including the water? Right. It, with the water, well, the water mostly drains out. The bucket on the end has some little ports to, with with the like 0.33 millimeter screens on them to let water out, but kind of hold everything else in. Yeah. Um, I was south of South Africa. We left out of Cape Town. And that's an area where the surface waters are mixing between a lot of different systems. Mm. And so there would be sometimes I would pull up the net and it would be almost empty. Right. I would have just like a little tiny little bit of debris. By the time I put it into a sample bottle, I think I was using mostly a 250 milliliter sample bottle. So not Mm. terribly large. Um, At first, they were pretty much empty. Right. I had maybe 50 milliliters in the bottom there. Um, Then as we, you know, as we got farther out and we kind of got to an area where warm currents from the Indian Ocean were mixing into colder currents from the south. So um, I just realized we could actually draw this here. So you came out of this sort of region and we're going up into yeah. here? No, we were just going straight down, but there's just oh. this current called the, oh gosh, Agulis. The Agulis current runs down the western coast of Africa and okay, then so kind of mixes into, mm-hmm, down here, uh, right. and on the other side of Madagascar as well. It kind of splits and like sandwiches it. Right. Yeah, and then it just mixes there with Atlantic water and also water from the Southern Ocean, and so right, it's just so that's a very... all more stuff coming up here, and you get a mixing. Yeah. Thing. Okay. And so sometimes you would cross through an area that was pretty dead, just old water, water that didn't have a lot of nutrients, and then other times I would get samples that were so full they almost didn't fit in the bucket. <laughs> so I had right. to like I had to detach the bucket from the bottom of the net over another bucket so I could catch everything else because it was full of mostly salps, which are little planktons that look like mm. I don't even know how to describe them they look like a jelly bean okay um, but they're very squishy um, <laughs> and it, or sometimes very small fish like fish larvae mm. um, and it, I would try my best to try to like pick some of them out and just chuck them back overboard but it's hard I can imagine it's hard they're very slippery and they yeah. also sometimes are full of plastic themselves so well yeah i was going to ask about that how do you account for the plastic present in those in your sample well um it, they're clear the okay. salps in particular are like completely clear so those i could just look at and if they if i could see plastic in them unfortunately they they stayed in the sample yeah. um but otherwise it was pretty easy to say like oh well this one like there's nothing in it i can just chuck it back overboard um but everything else stays in the sample. You then ship it back to your university or your institution, wherever you're going to study it. And then the next step is to desiccate it, which which is where you dry it out in an oven. Um, so every sample went into a beaker, and then that beaker was covered with aluminum, and then it went into a, a science oven. And it smelled exactly <laughs> as you would imagine. <laughs> we stank up. The entire floor. <laughs> Less than microwaving awesome. fish in some respects. And it was for days. Oh, so God. <laughs> if, low, if low tide were hot, 
<laughs> yeah, what the yeah. floor smelled like. I mean, look, I live in Australia and I have lived near the ocean. I understand what that smells like. Oh, yeah. It was not. I thought it was very funny. Um, the other student who was, who was studying the samples with me was mostly grossed out, but <laughs> it's fine. So you do that, you dry everything out, and then you end up with either kind of a little film inside of a beaker or you end up with like a kind of a sludge. Mm. You use a chemical process that Erickson might talk about. I don't remember exactly which chemicals we used. Um, I, I was you... honestly just looking at the numbers rather than the chemistry. I'm not a chemistry oh, person. Cool. <laughs> right, of course. So like basically you just use a couple different chemicals and then you heat them up. And what you're doing is you're breaking down all the organic matter. So this is part of the reason that it is very easy to manually count plastic. Right. So you're um, separate. So by organic matter, you mean not plastic. Yeah. 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 So you can. Um, there are chemicals you can use that when you heat them up and you pour them into, well, if you pour them into the, the sludge that you've created and then heat them up, they will completely break down mm. all of everything else i think hydrogen peroxide was one of the steps so it's, i'm not it surprised like, to be honest right it is just like what can we use that will like kind of blast these cells apart yeah yeah and then the organic material kind of floats to the top and most of the inorganic material um will is is more dense generally mm. and so you put them in kind of a filter like a funnel mm with a filter there's like a several step process but you're just removing anything that might have once been alive and eventually yeah. you end up with a little disc that is a very very thin a 0.33 millimeter um mesh with mm. all of your other shit on it that right you've, you've got left and that goes under a microscope and you got a pair of forceps and that's it. <laughs> that's oh what you boy. Do. Well, I mean, the main reason I asked that is that um, this y axis is on a log base 10 scale. Mm -hmm. So each unit increases an order of magnitude in base 10. Yep. And the top one is a million. So yep. to me, that means somebody went through and counted about a million different pl pieces of plastic from one of these samples. Well, this is extrapolated out to kilometers, like square kilometers. They're yeah. probably towing the net for, I think most of my toes were maybe a kilometer okay but mostly less than that mm. right so you're probably not and you're not that's a kilometer not times another kilometer that's a kilometer by you know a meter yeah and so they're probably not counting out a million they are probably counting out a lot and right it could be a massive amount of plastic that they're counting out through there mm. um it is the kind of thing that you do over a series of days if you have that much that you're going through. Yeah, I bet. You, with your forceps, with your little, like, science tweezers, um, we had clean jars, like, collection jars that we had weighed ahead of time. Um, and we would put the pieces as we found them. We would count them, like, with a, with a hand tally. We would put them in the jar. And so that at the end of it, you have not only a tally of how many pieces, but then you can also get the mass of how many pieces mm. were in that sample. So how do, is there a way to visually distinguish between a little piece of plastic and like a piece of rock? Yeah, there's actually a little guide that the U.S. National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration put out that has that. That is exactly that. It is okay, like yeah. how to tell if something is natural or not natural. Mm. Um, so there are things like, obviously, color is a big one. Uh, if it's a really bright color and you've put it through these chemical processes to break everything down, it's, it's probably, probably not, not a rock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If it's bright green, probably safe. Um, yeah. For fibers, it was things such as if you kind of pinch it with the tweezers and then bend it, does it stay bend, bent or does it break off? If it does, it's probably not plastic. Plastic fiber is usually pretty pretty flexible. Mm. Um, when it comes to something the size of like a rock or a pellet, uh, usually if it's if it's big enough, you kind of do a nail test, which is is like a kind of a thing in geology as well, where you kind of scratch at it, mm. and then you either feel it with your own hands. You can feel if it's a rock or not pretty pretty easily, or if you scratch it with forceps kind of what does it look like after you scratch it mm. Pl plastic will just kind of look different than a rock okay. um, but there are going to be very small particles that are are very difficult mm. 
And so there is definitely room for error there where you, you know, you could assume either way. You could assume too often that things aren't plastic when they are, or you could assume too often that things are plastic, are plastic when they, they aren't. just aren't. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the um, things that I have heard of, which isn't about plastic pollution so much as organism identification. So my mother did her PhD in, in like environmental chemistry and she was working in a lab with a person who was looking at like um, microbial life and you had your known taxa, your known species and everything else. And then OLGT, other little green things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I imagine that there's a lot of stuff you're just like, I'm not entirely sure what that is. And in that case, depending on how much money you have, like where yep. your funding's at, or wh just where you are. I was at the University of Washington. We did have mass spectrometers. Like we could try to get time on them. Mm. Um, you might be able to take all of those you know, all of those other bits, the miscellaneous that you've, that you've collect, collected someplace else and try to run them through a mass spectrometer mm. uh, to figure out the chemical composition. But more often than not, if it's not a huge portion of your sample, it just yeah. goes into the, the error that you're accounting for. Mm. So my next question, well, my next set of questions is actually about the logistics and sampling process specifically involved here. You said that these mantas are at the surface of the water. Correct. And I saw in both this, what's the name, Ericsson et al. and a couple of other papers they were talking about basically um, sampling and having modeling for basically the first 20 meters of Correct. ocean yeah. depth, which is a tiny fraction of ocean <laughs> depth, right? So yes. what happens to stuff that's deeper and how does depth change the presence of plastics? So, yeah. That's that's kind of the question. Yeah, right. When we're talking about ocean microplastics, it is like the thing that the first time I heard about it was kind of like what set me on this mm. you know, multi-year crusade just to try to understand what's going on. Um, we don't know. The options mm. are, your options for sampling are mantonettes, which are the most common, but not the only. You can use what are called bongo nets, which are two... Um, two circular nets that are open facing up towards the surface and mm. then they're lowered down to different depths and they have a cover over the top that can be um remotely closed right and so that's how you that's where you get the the collection that is at you know, 20 meters deep is that you've lowered a, lowered a bongo net at 20 meters you've let everything kind of filter down into it and then you've closed it and brought it back up or you can pull it back up for a certain amount of time and then close it and then pull mm. it up the rest of the way and so that's how that's how those sort of surface and near surface samples get taken. Um, in the bottom of the ocean, we look at sediment cores. Uh, mm. Sediment cores are really useful for a lot of different oceanography. Um, and if they, you know, if they happen to have plastic, uh, oceanographers like uh, geo oceanographers aren't, you know, they're not jerks. They're going to mm. go ahead and make a note of that plastic, and they're probably going to reach out to a researcher that they know who is interested in microplastics and work together to get a better sense of. Yeah. Like how to record that. Um, but for the intermediate depths, which, you know, is the vast majority of the ocean, we don't have a way of tracking that. Mm. Um, you can, when we lower, I mentioned it before, a piece of equipment called a rosette. It's kind of hard to describe. It's a series of, they're called Niskin bottles. They're these solid plastic bottles kind of in a ring. Mm. And they're all open, so as they lower this rosette down through the water column, water is flowing through the bottom and out through the top of these Niskin bottles. Mm. And you close it at depths where you want to collect sa water samples. Right, so they're basically like, um, if I can just draw a diagram here. So this is looking like down, and you have right. stuff around the outside. Exactly. And so they function as basically tubes until you want to take your sample, at which point you close them and they become vessels. Correct. Okay, uh, correct. Inference is also so drawn you... by um, like studying like the fish and stuff from those depths. Um, I've seen much less of that because we, well, I think part of that is going to be, it's going to dip into marine biology, which despite a lot of confusion, I am not, I'm not a marine <laughs> biologist. So, <laughs> I think those samples are just harder to come across a lot of the times when marine biologists are taking samples of creatures. 
Uh, first off, a lot of it is visual observation, mm. far more than than trying to collect fish samples. They they visually observe through cameras, through um, submersibles. And then when they do collect fish samples, I have found in coastal oceanography, where coastal marine biologists will or eco or ecologists will find plastics in a bunch of their samples of life, coastal life. And then they'll contact oceanographers or they'll contact other ecologists to talk about the plastic. So I assume a similar thing would happen between marine biologists and oceanographers, but that's still such a small sample size that mm. it's really not going to tell you enough to extrapolate outward. Um, the same with the Niskin bottles. They're such a small sample size that the chance of kind of capturing ocean plastic is very small. Mm. The other thing with the Niskin bottles is that you would have to... Usually on an oceanography cruise, those Niskin bottles that carry a few liters of water are being used by multiple teams studying different aspects. So when I was on a cruise, we had one team looking at um, oxygen levels in mm. different layers of the ocean. Because the minute you open a Niskin bottles to drain water out to collect it, you oxygen get oxygen starts, in there. Yeah, right. So those scientists had to collect the first you know, half a liter or more of water out of that bottle. Otherwise it, their sample would have been interrupted. It would have been, Bonk, a, yeah, it would have yeah. been a problem. Right. So like if you're doing ocean plastic though, you need the entire bottle. Mm. So it's another case where you can try to do that. But if other, you know, if you're on a research cruise where there's eight teams doing eight different types of research, you're probably not going to be able to take priority most of the time. Um, and even if you do, you're collecting, you know, a few liters of water in one spot in the ocean. As opposed to your, your like, pool nets, which go through 100, possibly thousands of liters of water over the duration. Exactly. Yeah. So even though they're very imperfect, it's still a much larger sample that you're able to kind of go through. Yeah. Um, so, same with sediment cores. You know, it's, mm. it's one sediment core at a time. And the fact that we're finding plastic is... is really troubling <laughs> yeah because you wouldn't expect to if it wasn't extremely common right exactly but it's still not enough to extrapolate outwards so how does the actual density of plastics affect where they are found like i know that there are plastics of just different density but are some do some just kind of sink down until they hit the depth at which they kind of stay or go all the way to the bottom and get collected in sediment cores as opposed to the ones that are in the surface um that's that's part of the great mystery is that uh, yeah. right um we do know there are definitely some plastics that are so dense that when we drop them in the ocean they immediately sink right yeah no question about it it's probably a fairly slow sink but they're going down um there are other plastics like uh think about a chip bag mm. right a crisp bag where it's it's very light you know it's gonna float when it gets into the water even if it fills with water it's going to float but what if it fills with water and then a bunch of barnacles yeah. decide it's a good thing to make it a home or a bunch of other creatures decide to lay eggs in there or, you know, it kind of keeps going on and on until it bioaccumulates so much just stuff that the density changes. That now suddenly mm. what used to be a very light piece of plastic is now a fairly dense kind of complex ecosystem in itself and then it might start to sink. Mm. or if you have a pellet that's floating maybe it's not fully floating at the top of the surface maybe it's just light enough that as you kind of like you hinted at like the buoy buoyancy kind of is achieved around a you know half a meter deep a couple meters deep well then a fish eats it and then as yeah. a fish eats it it doesn't hurt the fish it kind of like passes through the fish but then when the fish poops it out it's now covered with the other stuff the fish was going to poop out anyways mm. and that makes it more dense and so you end up with these bits of plastic that are all these different densities that right that might sink all the way down but no that might sink halfway down and when you're talking about density barriers in the ocean that's kind of the big defining factor between water masses is like yeah. where the different densities kind of bump into each other where those isopycnals are so extreme the different density layers that it kind of can't keep sinking anymore it mm, basically so hits a wall. Or, yeah. Right. And so that is one of the big theories is that we have these sort of, as we have gyres in the top of the ocean where a lot of different surface things are, are collecting, surface plastic, but also surface creatures, 
maybe there are kind of similar repositories in the middle depths mm-hmm. where we just have kind of clouds of not just plastic, but also maybe clouds of debris from above, maybe clouds of detritus that are just sort of kind of suspended there waiting for something to either change their density or for something large enough to kind of sweep through and cause a current that moves them into a different area. Mm. So the um, Kukula at all, so was talking about um, wind causing um, mm. turbulence, I guess, in the upper regions of the water. Other um, things like the Ericsson was looking at a model of ocean currents to see how plastic move over time. Mm-hmm. So this sort of modeling, I don't that there. I don't know anything about the field. Is there efforts to kind of combine the two so you can look at hor- kind of horizontal movement through the major ocean currents, but also vertical movement that is bringing things down to where those major ocean currents are? It, that kind of that understanding of our deep ocean currents. Uh, deep ocean currents are what kind of drives our global climate. Uh, to like just just as a base understanding, like it is very important that people understand that the deep ocean currents are what give us our seasons they're what give us our like our weather as we know it um and we didn't understand that we had deep ocean currents that were so remarkably different than the surface oceans until i believe it was in the 1960s or 70s bloody hell and the only reason we were able to track it is actually because of nuclear testing (laughs) right because the isotopes would show up exactly yeah Uh, and plastic is acting very similarly where okay. it's kind of one of the one of the less bad i guess um things to consider with with plastic is that we can use it to track some of how those those currents are moving but that is also to say that while we have a much better understanding of how those ocean currents are moving it's still very imperfect mm. you know we don't have you can't use satellite imagery to kind of see the border between where we have North Atlantic bottom water or where we have the water from the Southern Ocean. Like, we can't see that. We have to use temperature profiles or salinity profiles. So a lot of this modeling is still based on small samples of data extrapolated. Are the tides the explanation for the garbage islands in the ocean in terms of that's where they're all kind of directed toward? Um, no, that's that's so... The surface ocean currents are all driven by wind um there are other factors but like the wind is you know 90 percent, 95 percent of what is causing the the surface ocean currents um and the gyres in particular where we have our garbage patches like those are wind driven yeah and so that's where like what what kukula at all was looking at with wind driven turbulence um and what erickson at all used to model surface debris they're probably using very similar if not the same data sets for that Mm. so that's another thing that came up in the papers that you sent me was um looking at uh the sorts of like how do estimates of garbage outflows so plastic waste outflows from land as opposed to stuff that happens in shipping how does this match up with estimates of the plastic pollution that we see in the oceans so could you talk a bit about um, the like gap that has been proposed between these two measurements and then this Vice et al. paper that had a reclamation of that gap? The the Vice et al. paper is, is very new to me and I am very okay. interested to like kind of if you if you had time to look over it too, like to kind of talk through some mm. of its claims. Um, when I was going through my my undergraduate degree when I was learning um, learning about this, the gap between estimates and kind of uh, collection, like sample collections, mm. was a big deal. Um, yep. It was a big, or at least it seemed like a big deal to me because like ocean plastic became my pet project pretty quickly. Um, there are the way we the way we guess, essentially the way we do yeah. an educated guess at how much plastic is in the ocean or we expect there to be in the ocean is. There are studies of riverine inputs. And so we we know how much water is discharged from rivers around the world. We know that most of the fresh water, almost all the fresh water really, that goes into the ocean is from these rivers. Mm. And so 
by looking at the amount of plastic we expect to find in those rivers and then multiplying it by the expected outflow. annual discharge, right? The, the outflow from those rivers. That is primarily how we guess at how much plastic is in the ocean. Yeah. And so already, right, there's a lot of guessing happening. There's a lot of different fields at play where you have kind of limnology looking at the fresh water from lakes and rivers or also hydrology that understands the discharge from different water water basins mm. um and then you're kind of you know as an oceanographer you're relying on that data and then you're also maybe looking at studies of population density to kind of yeah. guess at how much plastic would be flowing through these rivers sometimes that's through direct observation sometimes it is through you know we're going to set up stations where we collect samples of water over you know over a year over several years over a season we're going to count the plastic that's in the water over those sample the sample dates the sample ranges and then we're going to extrapolate sometimes it really is just through well we know there's this many people in puget sound we know there's this much water that goes out of Puget Sound in a given year. We're going to say that it's probably about this much plastic. So, so this is something that's uh, quite an interesting little statistic, well, little interesting big <laughs> statistical problem is estimating this sort of stuff. And then, yep. because, you know, we, we can't have an estimate without an error, we try to produce an estimate of the error. Like, so how wrong do we think we are about this, basically? Right. Or and it's all extremely hard, and it is made a lot harder when you have limited resources to do the data collection and you don't have a great model for how this stuff behaves over time, or um, even just you don't have a great model for the actual amount of plastic that is present right. and how fast that might degrade into microplastics and things like that. Right. And you are, you're combining all of these very different oh, yeah. fields of science. And, uh, and I should say, uh, error compounds when you add up different things with the error as well, particularly right. if they have relationships between them. So it's just, it's cascading. It's yeah. a cascading effect. Um, scientists are at times very resistant <laughs> to talking to scientists from other fields <laughs> to better understand their data. So they, like, there's a very real chance that a lot of these extrapolations are based off of almost a almost a misreading of somebody else's mm. data where you kind of understand stuff to be to mean one thing when you're in your own field it doesn't always mean the same thing outside of your field with environmental factors like uh the um closing off of the niles floodplains for example affect how quickly plastics get into the water it, you know <laughs> probably <laughs> But all of that still relies on how directly are we actually studying this stuff. Yeah. So the Ericsson et al. paper in 2014, part of what makes it so foundational was they looked at both expectations from riverine outputs. They looked at modeling of surface currents um, that had been put together in part through studies of other like uh, plastic spills, like the rubber ducky experiment was a really, or not experiment, but... Yeah. The rubber ducky survey was a really big one where a ship, shipping container full of rubber duckies uh, went overboard. Mm. It was lost at sea. And then the rubber duckies were kind of found throughout the North Pacific. And they used these rubber ducks to map the Kuroshio current in the Northern Pacific. And a similar thing happened, I believe, in the North Atlantic with Garfield phones. Yeah, wasn't um, that a... Um a shipping container that went up washed up on a beach somewhere yeah but as it was on the beach it was releasing Things. more and more plastic phones out so <laughs> yes stuff like that happens a lot i feel like the rubber um, ducks could be a delightful mm. children's film <laughs> it's still a, like i think they still find them it went overboard <laughs> mm. forever ago um it is it is kind of that like there's a lot of examples of that have how pollution doesn't have to just be pollution pollution can also kind of work for us we can make the best of it and learn something from it not in a like you know a children's you like, wouldn't the do it deliberately but yeah, yeah. <laughs> right but if you already have all these radio radioactive isotopes in the air you might as well just kind of see where they end up yeah yeah so that right. vice paper um i'm just gonna write the name down Oh, right. That is to say the gap between the expected riverine outputs oh, of right. plastic and the plastic that was sampled in Ericsson et al. and in many, many research groups since then. 
the gap has been huge and that we expected there to be a lot of plastic and we're finding a lot of plastic, but significantly less than we expected. And that is yeah. where there has formed this theory of missing ocean plastic where most oceanographers that I have talked to or that I have read papers from sort of believe that it is in the process of sinking into the open ocean, into the yeah. seafloor, or that it is suspended someplace in the middle and it has just become like neutrally buoyant, unable yeah. to rise back to the top or to sink down to the bottom. Those are the two kind of most common understandings of this. This Weiss paper that came out last year looks like it's trying to upend those understandings. Mm. I'm going to spell this wrong. Is it O-U or U-O? Oh, I am. You were asking the wrong person. Oh, no. <laughs> I type it into a Google search, like a Google search, and yeah. let it correct me. I'm going to go U-O. Buoyant. Okay. So this this paper was saying that the gap isn't as big as people think. I'd just like to point out, I thought that you were saying their name is like vice, as in like inherent vice or whatever. <laughs> it's more like Edelweiss. <laughs> yes. So basically, I only skimmed this, so please go and read the paper if you're more interested in that. What they seem to be saying is that the estimation processes for the outflows from rivers are greatly overestimating the amount of plastic that's actually going into the ocean. So there is some bias in the estimation process there which gives bigger numbers like orders of magnitude bigger mm. than what it actually is so they are attempting to offer a strategy to rectify that let's say and uh it's, uh, it's optimistic in that respect because <laughs> it it means that no no it's, it's not quite as bad as we thought or at least not the stuff that's coming off the land the stuff that's being dumped into the ocean still pretty bad right right i guess my big thing with this is um not that they're one, they're using the statistics to combat statistics. So, <laughs> yes. Right? Like, all of, all, like, <laughs> their There's methods so much uncertainty so, there, yes. I know. Their methods are not based on direct sampling, just as the methods of the people who make the initial models were not largely based on direct sampling. So, you are still, like, several levels removed from the only way to accurately understand this, right? Yeah, um, and so this, I'm just going to say, this happens quite a bit when your measurement process is very hard. Yes. It's not to say that anybody is wrong or incorrect. They're not malicious to do this. It's right. just that, you know. I mean, this kind of like, this exact kind of use of statistics and use of statistical modeling is, you will encounter it every day and not know it's happening. Like, your weather forecasts are done this way. <laughs> um so it's not to say that anybody is right is it being malicious like willfully malicious or willfully ignorant it's that there's a lot of different wiggle room and math is not as straightforward as you might think it is yeah and also like because you have really really sparse data and because your understanding of the error in that data is quite limited connecting m numbers to actual things observed in the environment is really really hard i mean right like what you were talking about before about the limited access to data from like middle mid depth of the ocean you can think about it as kind of similar to looking at the volume of outflow of the river you can't take consistent reliable samples across a river i mean some of these rivers are really bloody big and right. the amazon is the biggest input as you might imagine it's the biggest yeah, river yeah. in the world it's also the biggest input and it's miles wide in yeah. areas so you can't <laughs> The, the Amazon River Delta is massive. You cannot accurately go through and sample every section of the Amazon River Delta. Yeah, and across the mouth of the Amazon River, you will have different outflows and different yes. densities of plastic coming out. Yeah. So it's a really big problem, and it's really, really hard. And because a lot of these research projects are desperately underfunded, they just <laughs> can't do it. And my boy Bolsonaro is right. really working hard to get that... Uh... <laughs> that uh, level of plastic pump those up. numbers up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> eventually it'll reach the peak of where how many times he's been diagnosed. Almost. With COVID. It's <laughs> almost. He's, every time he gets diagnosed with COVID, he generates a bunch more of those little plastic like test vials. <laughs> and he can just in straight in the Amazon. Um, I I guess this paper kind of like okay. Initially, it rubs me the wrong way just because it is you know. It's upsetting. Anytime, yeah. <laughs> anytime somebody tells you that like your fundamental understanding of a problem is wrong, 
you're you know i think most of us our first reaction would be like well it says who yeah um, yeah but i guess i have like two i have two i don't know if they're i don't know what to call them two points i guess one is that like well do we need to do we care do we care if it's less i don't want people to worry less about ocean plastic because there yeah. might be less of it, it there is a like complacency I people, is a danger yes complacency is dangerous like we don't need to feel like things are hopeless but we do need to understand that things are you know grave at this point like it is serious <laughs> and we need to like look at serious pressures we can put on like global organizations to try to fix the problem so why are you going out there telling us that we might be wrong and then that to that point i guess i would look at if i could figure out who their funders were um still most environmental funding like most environmental research is funded through third parties mm. and those third parties have ulterior motives right they're not doing science for science's sake um but i mean a more charitable look at this is like okay well if vice at all is telling us that there's probably less plastic than we assumed what's the only way to verify that and Go it's and do to do some sampling more, it's yeah. to do more direct sampling and so, so in that way having this sort of this gap between two different like perceptions of how much plastic there might be in the ocean maybe that drives a sort of competition to see who can who can get better samples mm. who can find a way and there there are emerging methods to try to look at the middle depths so like maybe this is a good way to get funding towards them Mm. You know, if, if Vice at all, if, as long as we don't stop, essentially, I guess is what I'm saying. As long as we don't look at this <laughs> one report and say, okay, well, then it's fine. Oh, this will upset that's... you, Sarah. So uh, oh, no. our <laughs> one of the um, big science, like government funded science uh, institutions in Australia called the CSIRO, a few years back, um, because of government pressure and because of funding pressure, basically came out with, well, we know global climate change is happening, so we don't need to study it anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> yep. So I I don't have I don't I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> I mean, this this Fuck! Is, is the pretty understandable reaction. To this is after they'd already stripped the CSIRO for copper parts, essentially. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> and forced it to um, have a. Uh, like business ready product for any research it did more or less which is just oh yeah yeah it's great what that fundamental science research in the US as well <laughs> is like oh well if you want funding for research you have to already be able to carry out that research and it's like well no we need funding to be able to get the equipment to carry yeah. out the research it's and god help you if you have something that's n not commercially viable but will be right. used for generations to come so that's actually anyway. that brings up like two points. Well, no, that's like directly related to like this this issue in that um, in the U.S. and this isn't you know specific to the U.S. It's common everywhere. But um, I'm about to like start uh, a <laughs> series I think on this. In the U.S., the way environmental science gets funded and has this has been the case since the 1950s is through the military. Mm. And if you know if anybody thinks the military is out there studying ocean science for like science sake or for altruism uh, you're naive <laughs> like yeah the, they like the navy cares about these things because they feel like there is a strategic use for it All right so first off that's that's part of it is like anytime you see a paper that maybe seems too obvious or has like an answer that seems too simple go to their go to whoever funded the research mm. because if you see somebody who wants that conclusion you shouldn't be skeptical of the researchers necessarily, but just read really carefully about their methods in particular, mm. or do their methods and do their samples match their conclusions, because that's where you're going to see a lot of disconnect. Um, and then I had a second point that I think I forgot because I, I'm just upset. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess uh, overall this stuff desperately needs more money and it needs yeah. much better better material support to do good sampling in order to get good data out well if we take the spacecraft example i think what we need is to bring back the soviet union i know this is my solution <laughs> to a lot of problems but <laughs> doing research that is uh not necessarily profit oriented <laughs> we just need to like drive that competition that was yeah. actually um when climate change when climate change first started being studied 
uh, it was from oil companies, and initially they were studying climate change so that they could basically for that it was in like the 60s and 70s it was essentially a cold war thing whereas oh if we study climate change and we as enron um find more sustainable energy sources we are gonna look so much fucking better than the rest of the world we're gonna look like hot shit and then they had one like i've read this in a few different sources at this point there's basically one intern who was an intern in the climate change research group who went above his boss's heads, like the researchers he was working under, and he went above them to just, you know, executives in Enron and was like, hey, but or what if we hide all this data and we just use it to, like, find other sources of coal? What if we just, you know, we take all this environmental science that is telling us we're ruining the earth and use it to find oil deposits offshore? What if we did that instead? Oh. And, and that's that's essentially how we ended up where we are. It's just like one asshole <laughs> kind of feeding into other like other personalities that were very like very okay with it. God damn. Maybe one day down the line, if somebody decides to trace the history of all this shit, they'll find that person and that person will be known for their crimes. Just yeah, just stick their head in a the toilet. <laughs> They're probably yeah. already dead. Like, I hope so. And like, no bullying except for people who are executives or working with executives at oil companies. I mean, I'd go further than that. <laughs> I have a <laughs> list. <laughs> okay. Toilet for a long time. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Yeah, there's other people who deserve it. If you've ever worked for Murdoch, media, <laughs> straight in the toilet. All right. I would say that's a podcast. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. This is really great. Where can people find you? People can find me uh, wherever pods are cast. Uh, it came from the sea, um, where I talk about other ocean science or not always ocean science, but always ocean relevant topics. Um, you can also find us on Twitter at From the Sea Pod, I think. Um, I'll stick it in the show notes below. And we also do visual aids, but the visual aids are only found through my Patreon. They are up for everybody you don't have to pay for it but i am gonna make you go to the patreon because i am a little gremlin oh yeah (laughs) so that's where you have to go to find them you should you should definitely also go to our patreon because our visual aids are on the youtube channel but there's a lot of um we put slides and scripts and things up there when i remember to if i edit uh episodes before they are due they are there as well and we have monthly uh bonus episodes that are only available through the patreon feed all right, Bart, thank you for coming on again. Thank you very much. Um, if you happen to have stumbled upon this episode in a YouTube hole, um, follow me on Twitter, at Snitch and Orwell. No G. <laughs> All right, and I'll talk to you later. Speak to you then. Bye.